Hello everybody, welcome to Art Matters on this lovely sunny Sunday afternoon and welcome to Steve Hill. Hi Steve. Hello there, how are you Sandy? I'm fine. Some of you watching, uh, if you happen to know me in my teaching capacity, may also recognise Mr Pill, um, because this is actually a fascinating element in addition to all the other fascinating things we're going to say today in that I have met you Steve through um, knowing you at school as a, as a fellow secondary school teacher um, and the reason why I think that's so extraordinary is sometimes people all around us have got the most unbelievable and hidden talents. Um, what do you think about that? Yes, I think I think it's right. I, I, I think that uh, we all sort of ha hide lights under bushels, I think, and we all kind of have a sense of keeping cards close to our chest. I think we, we all kind of express certain things that we're comfortable with. And in other aspects of our lives, we kind of keep them a little bit closer to ourselves. Yeah. So the reason why we're talking today is because the light you've been hiding under a bushel is that you're actually an artist. Mm. Um, and somebody who has been making art for a long time. Yes, yes, I have. Yeah. Uh, in line with my teaching career, I think, I think a lot of it really was stimulated at the beginning of that, which has been a long one. I've been teaching since 1990, so a long, long time, really. And well, I've been in classrooms since 1990. Um, and I think that that process of, of, of being in a classroom with other human beings um, creates certain kinds of energies, if you like, within yourself as an individual that have to be addressed and looked at. It, and I think this is one of the big challenges for all teachers really, you know, is how we sustain the work that we do day in, day out, over and over, years in, years out, and how we enable that to continue to be fresh every day. I think that's the biggest challenge really that we all have. And do you think that making art uh, in your private life has enabled your teaching? Yes, or without a shadow of a doubt. I think that what it's enabled me to sustain over the period of what, 25, well, 30 years, over 30 years actually, uh, is a, a capacity to keep on turning up every day fresh, being able to, um, the, the smile on my face every day is, is something I've had to work at. <laughs> it's not just something that naturally occurs. But there's um, a, I think uh, maybe a dual purpose to that if we look at it around the other way. Um, in that, you know, being an artist informs teaching, but maybe yeah, also yeah. informs I, art practice. Yes, I think I think the way that it informs my teaching is is that is that that art, painting, making, um, putting something on a 2D flat surface enables the, the, the opportunity for reflection. I think that's the biggest thing for me. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a reflective meditative process that enables um, a, a kind of a new view to be seen every day. That's, that's how I can describe it really. It's, it's a sort of a, a, an almost a gathering of energy, mm -hmm. um, a, a, a placing of energy somewhere, which then enables fresh energy to keep turning up. It's probably, it's kind of, that's how it kind of works for me, or has done. So in the past uh, week, you very kindly gave me some of your workbooks to bring mm -hmm. home with me and have a look through. Um, and we've had conversations on and off um, mm -hmm. about how one furthers one's practice as an artist or if feeling a bit stuck or, you know, what can, what can we do? I suppose when we're also working really hard every day, in what some people think of as our regular jobs, how do we push along, move through, or transition our work, perhaps to, to echo how we are now in this present moment? And in looking at your books, which by the way has been an enormous privilege, things that have really stood out to me, quite how um, literate you are. Not literal always, although there's an element of that as well, but that in your workbooks there's a lot of uh, pages full of image, but there are also many pages full of writing. 
Um, can you tell me a little bit about why you write so much? Liberation. I think that, that what the word enables me to do is to liberate. I think that, that, that I, I find that from a professional point of view, profession, the, the profession for me has been very much um, a, a, a kind of a grid upon which I have had to fit. I'm talking about expectations, professional expectations, um, uh, expectations within an, an organization, whatever school it happens to be, they're always going to have these expectations of the way that things should be on a, on a national level and also on a sort of a local level. Mm -hmm. And I find that, that in order to fit the grid, I needed somewhere in which to be liberated. So in the process of liberation, I'm able to then fit. Without the process of liberation, fitting for me as a personality is difficult. Um, the, that's how I've used it. On the screen just now, we've got an image mm. that popped up relatively recently on your Instagram feed. Uh, and it's you, 52 yeah. years ago, yeah. floating over your street at mm. home in Wales. Um, can you give us an introduction to your work as such, as a visual? Yeah, artist? yes. Uh, <laughs> um, it's funny because when I first saw this as being the first one, that the, my first response was a was a, a sense of giggle, because I, I think there's an element of um, I, I think the the kind of way in which I created it. You know, you look at it, you can say, "Oh, that's a." A childlike drawing, if you like, you know, it's used in a very kind of um, naive way. It 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 kind of is. It, it, there's a sense of playfulness to it, uh, and it, it it also makes me feel, and I say makes me feel, I want to giggle, because th there are elements to this particular drawing, painting, whatever you want to call it, which. And number one is sort of anchored in my memory of, of real experience, not necessarily flying, of course, Sandy, because I don't kind of naturally fly every day like that, but there's an element in it that, that are realities. So the yellow house right in the middle there, for instance, is the house I was, that I, I grew up in from about the age of two onwards. Um, part of a terrace street for about 13 and 14 houses in South Wales, a place called Caffili. And the street had probably about three or four mining families in it at the time. And it was, it was a rude awakening actually, that, that house, because we'd lived in a previously, um, a, a wimpy type house on, a, on a, a new estate. And suddenly I found myself at the age of two in this very, very new environment, which was dark, cold, um, one tap, no central heating, um, and uh, it, be, it then became my home for the next 16 years since I was 18. And, uh, but I think that the element of it is that, the, for instance, the figure over the house there is wearing a yellow type of coat um, as, a, as a little two, three, four year old. I had this yellow coat I used to, I was given by my family, by my parents, that was my pride and joy. My yellow coat was something that was really, really important to me. Another aspect of this as well is the cape, because in my childhood, Batman and Robin were the kind of the cartoon comic characters at the time. Yeah. And so my childhood was about emulating Batman, being oh, Bat Boy. I mean, I did think about Batman actually as a reference. Yes. Also, I mean, purely visually, there's obvious relationship between the sun, the coat and the house. Um, and I, I mean, this is an obvious question one way, but in another way, I suppose we could really go into this in great detail um, about the kind of particular relationship between your work and memory and mm. how that seems to stimulate a lot of your outcomes, even when later we'll see your outcomes also often are recording what feels very present. Mm. There's somehow a legacy of memory again that seems terribly obvious doesn't it that we have all our experiences leading up to wherever we might be now but um 
I use this word in a way that isn't intended at all to be offensive, but when there's something regressive or when looking backwards through time to make work now about what's in the past. Yeah, I, I wonder about your relationship to memory. Um, I mean, you've explained yeah. a little bit about the kind of context you grew up here. It was a rude awakening. It was cold and dark. Yes. But you've also made it so incredibly warm. Yes. Warm. Yes, because I think that's what it became. I think those were the, the starting point was that. But I think I was in a, I suppose, a, a, a loving family. I knew I was the eldest of three. Well, in, when we first came to the house, there was myself and my sister, who was 18 months younger. Um, a mum and a dad, um, and a sense of closeness and togetherness, and a sense of kind of warmth. So that that was there. My brother then came along a couple of years later and was born in one of those top rooms of that house. And the, the, the culture was a warm communal culture, full of humour. Very very funny time in my life. Fun, great friendships, great memories. But underlying it all was that sense of warmth. So from a beginning, which was, you would describe as a, a physical environment, which was cold and dark, the emotional environment was always warm, caring and close mm -hmm. and a sense of identity of, of togetherness and community. So the, the houses were characterized, for instance, by um, very, very low walls right throughout the whole street. So you could walk into the back of the garden there'd be dry stone walls, but you would know from number one to number 14 what everybody was up to in each back garden. So there were no fences, fences didn't exist. There was a sense of, of close community um, that people were talking, you know, waving, impromptu meetings, impromptu kind of gatherings of children were possible because the communication between those places was there. So I, I find this an interesting thing in itself that we have somebody who comes from uh, a life in which community is extremely important, mm. in which that kind of childish playfulness or childhood playfulness is of vital significance. And yet in adulthood now, um, is, there a, is there a sadness? In yes, it's a good point. I think there's a sadness for a community and, and a context lost, definitely. I think that that the the professionalization of us as individuals, well, I can talk to myself, I suppose, that, that in becoming a professional with professional values, mm -hmm. there are a, a sense of order that isn't there in childhood. My childhood was really, really happy and a lot of it was based on the freedom to move so we could go out we could go anywhere there was there weren't very many adults around there was it was almost like a sort of a childhood heaven where you could move and be free and liberated and i think that that bringing that into adult life has always the difficult has been the restriction of adult life the inevitable restrictions that you have as a professional um as an as, a, as an individual as you grow up and the expectations that that kind of guide our lives, almost like a grid, if you like. I look at the grid mm -hmm. and I see uh, for myself, that sense of liberation has never left me. It's always been part of me. So it's how do I place that in a, an adult life, if that makes sense. There's a kind of a, 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 kind of a, a an attempt to pull in together two diametrically opposed mm -hmm. senses. One of straight lines, the other one of curliness. Yeah, I kind of wonder about the resolution of conflict in oneself mm. here. You know, yeah. that when coming from kind of an idyllic childhood in so many ways, and then perhaps losing that freedom. So the very normal uh, mm -hmm. realisation of adulthood, that in a lot of the, the, the written elements of the book, your books four that I have here, I mean, something like this is very striking. I mean, visually, actually, it's striking anyway. Um, but also, there's a kind of yearning, I feel, um, to make good, to be happy. Um, and I don't think that means that you're unhappy, but it seems to be such a pressing matter. It, it is, it is. And I think there's that kind of sense of that Welsh heraith, that, that sense of being an exile that sense of, of being away from home. 
um, I think is is something that I mean I left home when I was 18 went to university in England for the first time um, and kind of returned once or twice for periods of maybe a couple of months at a time in the early days but then essentially I then became exiled so by a certain point in my life um, that was something that I, I suppose in a sense I physically left but not emotionally left so there's always that constantly searching and returning back. If that can't happen on a physical sense, it becomes something that is that is something I kind of like dip into and I and I and I kind of have a sense of happiness. So I find myself as an adult life, I know where happiness is, if that makes sense. I know where it is for me, I know where contentment is. And a lot of the contentment for me is that returning to that point and that kind of feeling of what it was at that age, which then is a is a kind of a direct bridge into my adult life as well um so there's a kind of a sense of blessing in that in that i've got a bridge into that childhood which also gives me a bridge back out of that childhood as well into adulthood okay so the art itself is the manifestation of the need to return yeah yes a need to return absolutely a constant cycle return absolutely this is pretty early on in one of your sketchbooks and it, I think it's buffered either side by very interesting uh, pieces of writing and indeed diagrams of rugby. <laughs> yeah. So you have lots of things that you do. I mean, anyone who follows you on Instagram will know. Um, I mean, I think you say it even in your blurb, your personal blurb, that you, you're on the water every day. You do so many different things. Um, I've got lots of evidence again surrounding me right now in these books of, of somebody who's constantly moving. Mm. And I wonder if that m movement is agitation or if it's something that is not as maybe it's not a dark movement mm. in that when somebody cannot stay still, I would question what is it that's making them move so much? Mm. Yeah. Again, um, movement, I think, if we, for me, if I, it, it's something that is all, is, I, I, I call it an energy. It's an energy that's there that has been from a very, very young age, manifest itself in physical movement as a child. Mm. That then over time became more organized in terms of a sport so you know that movement as a kid running around in fields climbing trees jumping over brooks of rivers then kind of became more organized through the school process of becoming organized sport which is rugby for me because again the choice in those days sandy in wales was rugby or rugby um and there wasn't any other choice that was it now, again, I suppose historically within my family, my, my, my dad was a, was a rugby player um, and also a runner. Uh, so there was a kind of a genetic connection there, and uh, which then enabled me to very early on excel at rugby from being the age of, age of 10. Being In Wales, they select from a very, very young age. So I was already being selected for teams at that kind of age. And then I suppose as time went on, I, I eventually then represented my country in rugby. So I played for Wales schools under 19s and I was also Wales schools long jump champion. So 1981. So for me, th that movement energy, that aspect has always been there. And I found that as my, as my sport, my organized sport kind of got less when I got to about the age of 28, 29, I kind of formally retired from rugby. Having having played, I suppose, at a level which was which would which is televised rugby. So I was playing matches on television, that type of thing. So I, I then had to sort of as soon as that rugby kind of stopped, this kind of movement on 2D pages started. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there was almost a like closing down of physical movement, but a kind of like an in, an increased kind of phys movement within within a kind of a, on a 2D space, yeah. I wonder how that reconciles though, because we have something that is about an enormous physicality. Uh, and I'd say mm. enormous because the whole body moves yeah. in sporting action. And mm. of course there's movement when making work and drawing, mm. but it's so 
quiet by comparison. Mm. Um, sometimes when I'm looking at your work, I, I mean, the marks that are made, whether it's, again, forgive the term if in any way this offends you, but in the kind of more naive work that you produce, th there's a sense of marks that are made hurriedly, a, a, a quickness of drafting. Mm. Um, I wonder about that with you for what's it like for you to sit down and draw something for many hours? I think how it is for me is I kind of found my way to meditation. Um, and I think that that what that has enabled actually I'll, I'll step back a little bit one of the one of the things I decided to do was to spend a lot more time drawing so when I when I initially around about 1990 became a teacher I'd always been drawing I mean there were stories of me as a as a very very little child and I go back you see it's interesting I return back to the past again where you know from a very very young age reports of me finding pots of paint painting people's coal bunkers painting the house at home preschool um, finding my dad had a garage where, you know, um, you know, sort of a filling up garage, petrol garage. And I'd be in the back there. I'd find my way into the MOT garage and find pots of paint to be painting cars that had kind of been bought in for their MOTs and this kind of thing, you know, what are we going to do with this child was, was a kind of, he's, he's on the move all the time. He's painting things. So that kind of had always been there. Sport sort of took care of that energy with the structure. And then I found myself again without, with the energy and without the structure, if that makes sense. So I had teaching, that was great, but it, it, the process of drawing was I found myself stopping and staring more and more at stuff. I found myself kind of having a need to kind of really start to look at the world around me. Mm. And I found that by doing that, the, the challenge of sitting still and stopping and staring and looking at what was really in front of me, I found became meditative. I almost discovered meditation through that process. That I, 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 that I started to draw in a kind of uh, looking, but without caring what was actually going down onto my page. And the other challenge I presented to myself was I wanted to draw the speed of a snail. Now, of course, drawing the speed of a snail and then looking at something slowly created a real conflict within me as an individual. Mm. Uh, the conflict was, is I wanted to go fast, but the challenge was slow down. <laughs> um, and I, that was just an, a, a kind of a, a, a challenge adventure for myself to find out what that meant. What I found through that process was that I realized I'd been kind of running on full engine for many, many years. And the, the fact that I started to slow down and look and stop and stare meant that I could go into idle space. I could idle rather than be kind of in fifth gear and going down a motorway. Mm. And that idling process, um, kind of the, the feelings it gave within me was a sense of anchoring, groundedness, a sense of calm, sense of peace. Mm. And that never kind of left me really. That, that, so that was then drawing outside myself, looking in. So I was, I was looking at the world around me, what was really there. And then I kind of found myself in that sitting process. I start, for whatever reason, started to close my eyes and draw. So what I was then doing was I was going into this process of, OK, so what is the feeling I'm feeling? What, how am I at that particular moment in time? And what type of mark would that be? So there's a translation of me going on if that makes sense then i do i do wonder with this um in terms of there being uh sometimes when people talk about meditation in some way or that it's a meditative practice to, to look and to draw mm. um i i would agree loosely but i would also question if there's an element of suppression right in that yeah outcome. and i do wonder when looking at this kind of work for example um and some of your what we would think of as more abstract work that there's much less suppression or bringing to heal than when we have things and we'll see as we go through in greater detail. So I, I've done a I've done a kind of overview. These aren't necessarily chronologically accurate, 
but I thought this was an interesting thing. Almost like we start, I guess, in like an amoebic state. Yes. And then we go to something that starts to be what many people would think of as representational, even though still quite naive. Mm. And I'm, I'm wondering if at this point I'm, I'm seeing a transition from somebody who is entirely liberated and just doing, making the marks, uh, being in the action moment, the present, into somebody who's present in a different way here, mm. but that is in, in not just the action of making the mark, but is in the action of deliberately slowing themselves down. And though the images become busier in one way, that in so many other ways, they perhaps become full of tension. Mm. And I don't know what you, how you would respond to that, what you would say to, mm. to that kind of sense. I think I think that the tension for me is the internal and external. Yes, I think that there's a there's a kind of a thin veil between the two things. I find myself looking at the external world with this kind of sense of energy within myself, which is always almost like best way to describe is like a fire, an energy, um, and I find that that when I look outside of myself and record, because I would say for me, there's a sense of recording in this. Mm. And when I, when I record what is in front of me or attempt to record, I, I can do it for so long before it dissolves. <laughs> I, I think there's a kind of irony though. There's a sense of being active and passive. Mm. So for, for me, this is like highly active. Mm. And this is becoming less active. Mm. This is relatively passive. And still is reactive, of course, because in the recording of the space, one is responding to what is seen. Mm. You are responding to what is felt. Mm. Now, I'm interested in that almost like a sliding door. Mm. where we have something active going to passive, where we have something that's responsive as much as reactive. And we, mm. we then have like a crossover of how much you have to suppress or indeed relish the energy yeah. that you emit, not just that is, but that you actually emit. And I may not have picked the ones you would have picked, but I thought this almost like as a sequence illustrates it. And if I go further still, lots of people watching this will think, well, this is very busy. <laughs> but to me, the agitation in this is not about what is drawn, it's about what is happening to enable this kind of drawing for someone yeah. like you who's highly yes. energized, highly energetic. Yeah. And then I thought I'd put this in because this is like a, an anomaly moment <laughs> I found. And there's a couple of these on your Instagram and they're very paired back. And no matter what else might be happening in all this energy through your work, these are very muted. Can you tell us a little bit about this kind of work? Yes. Uh, I think looking at this type of, yeah. So there is, there's a sense of looking outside in because that is, that's an image underneath Boscombe Pier. Yeah. You've got the arches in Boscombe Pier there. You've got parts of the sea that have kind of created pools on the sand. So you've got a bit of a sandbank. And you've got a kind of a sense of, of, of water and then looking out into the distance. So I think that this, this is like this because there it's worked from an image that's always been that's already been created. So the tension in this one for me is loss or, or is not as not there because the, the image has already been settled before I actually started it. 
I just so, I think I yeah. know what you mean, but I think there's going to be maybe need to be further explanation of that. Mm. Can you explain that a bit? Uh, in a different yeah. Way? So it, okay. So a photographic image is made. Yeah. Um. So that then becomes a, it, it. I find that a sense of uh, it becomes almost an easier thing to just copy. So there, the tension for me in this is not a kind of a feeling of looking at a, a, a real moment. It's a moment that has been um, changed by time. Photograph taken, time happens, selection of this particular image. Mm. I think I just like the way that you had this kind of patterning in the water, the reflection going on of the arches and a sense of composition and structure. I quite like that. I quite like the tonal differences within it. Mm. But the decisions I was making were, were sort of um, more um, detached from myself as a person, should we say. There were visual choices I was making which weren't based upon energized choices. I don't know if I'm explaining particularly very well there, but th there's, a, there's a distancing in this, there's a detachment. And I think within that detachment, there becomes a kind of a greater sense of um, calmness, maybe. But are you looking for calm ever? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I think I just, I, I think I was looking for rhythmic pattern in that. For me, there was this, I was just interested by those lines that just are in the foreground, almost like a bit like a, a bit of a zebra hmm. reflecting the Boscombe Pier arches. So that was just a kind of interesting kind of just playfulness. And also the windows up in the corner as well of Boscombe Pier, which are reflective. So you've got right up in that sort of top left-hand corner, there are several of those white marks. They become kind of visual elements of, of repeating pattern. So there was a patterning that I was quite interested in. With yeah, that. I mean, your work, uh, I haven't shown maybe any particular examples mm. about this but you can see lots of patterns mm. um, very busy patterns yeah, in, yeah. Uh, busy. Of your portfolio yeah um this just really stood out to me because it, it is actually so different mm. and again you, you're using the word energy i'll use it too is that energetically this has a totally different feeling mm. as a viewer as somebody looking mm. And, yeah. and then mm -hmm. something like this, you know, we have an artist who is making work that looks like this, making work that looks like this. I can see the relationship here. This is like, wow, where did this come from? And you're explaining mm -hmm. it. And then we come to work that looks like this. Mm -hmm. And again, I mean, I'm looking in your, your books, as I say, and you know, looking here at something I picked out, the message is becoming clear. Make love paintings. All mm. is about love. All my work derives from the uh, constant striving to return to the loving or loved condition. Mm. Now, again, that speaks to me about what you've said already about childhood. But more broadly, you talk a lot about love and peace. Mm. Um, in making work like this, you know, are you are you showing as an emotion, and are you intent on creating emotional responses in your viewer, or is it simply that you need to record or harness the energy of emotion in what you do? In that, is it is it relevant to say that somebody might feel? from looking at your work or is it enough to say that you feel when making it? I think, I think it's probably a little bit of both. I think that there, for me, there's a feeling of message in it. There's a feeling of, of uh, almost a, a, a conversation that is kind of beyond words that needs to be shared. Um, and in that process, I, I, I am left with a feeling of that has been said. It's almost like a sort of like a, 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 a sentence, a paragraph, a, a novel, something which has been kind of shared out into the world. 
and has kind of left me empty is probably the wrong word because empty implies that I've lost something. Well, you do. I think I've just passed places. some. You talk in other places in your books about emptying out. Mm. Um, you know, like through a process of emptying, you make your work. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but I wonder is, is, that, is, is, that, on, sorry. is that reductive in itself? I think there's a there's a there's a feeling that I'm left with after this kind of process mm. that gives me a one it gives me a wonderful sense of something said that is once said is out there and said and I'm left with a sense of I've said it well <laughs> if that makes sense it's, uh, it's been said it, it's the same true when you make work that looks like this now that, that again is there's there's a sense of, of for me it, it tends to be that becomes more kind of philosophical it's more intellectual and it, it's intellectual from the perspective of the the immediate foreground mm -hmm. is a literal space it exists it it's kind of a, you know a drawing of um a room in my house with a garden um with with doors now those kind of doors, those kinds of lines, those bless you, those kinds of um, grids are a sense of containment, a sense of order, a sense of rational, a sense of logic, a sense of kind of, um, yeah, I go back to the word containment. Mm. And then outside, there's this kind of sense of a different world, a different kind of space, a different possibility, a space of, of um, childlike feeling of, of, of a sense of um, movement and a sense of kind of like anything becomes possible. You can fly, uh, you, can, you can kind of jump around the place. There's a sense of joy for me in that kind of way of representing, a sense of liberation and freedom. And the important there is that is that boot that leaves the door slightly open, because once again, there becomes a kind of a, a bridge, a barrier between the two worlds becomes possible. They're not shut off from each other. So I think the, there has to be some kind of sense that they exchange. Yes. The yeah, the, that, the, the boot by the door, keeping the door open is an important point in this picture for me. The important point is, is that is that one can kind of be held simultaneously in the same space. But when so, it looks like this. Yes. Again, so that, know, I'm using the word yes. decision, but you know, there, there maybe isn't the same tension of there being two, spa two realities or two spaces. Um, I mean, it, this, doesn't, this doesn't happen as far as I can see in all of your work in such an obvious way. Hmm. But I do wonder this, if it is occurring even over yeah. time where there's there's an interchange between energy, freedom, uh, containment, uh, and there's a constant oscillation between kind of like two states. Like yes. What I'm interested in and want to know Mm. is how you move now with that oscillation. Um, the, the oscillation for me is, is that if you, if you take that image there, this image, and you go back to the previous one, which is kind of all over that one. So that one is metaphorically for me in the garden outside. So that's me actually being outside the house, the order, the structure, the drawing, which is in the kind of the foreground is a kind of um, a contained kind of, yeah, not, not a cage that you can escape because it's also a sense of, or a prison that you're held in, but uh, uh, having the door that enables you to move between the two, I would describe them as being, for me, adulthood, childhood that there's kind of like two aspects that, you know, that, that kind of works between the two spaces. 
that I can kind of, I suppose in a sense, move into that garden as a metaphor and be jumping around, flying about, colour, light, freedom, liberation, deciding to go where you want, when you want, at any time you want, whatever takes you, wherever you want to be, to that more kind of contained adult, we have to be in our professionals pot at eight o'clock, we have to do our lunchtime, we then do our kind of end of, end of school, if we were talking professionally. There, there's a kind of, the, there's a time element in this. So time, the structure that we have in our everyday lives, kind of like fades away when you go through that door into the other world, it becomes timeless. Time is kind of not of, of a kind of, um, it, it's almost like that flow state where you kind of lose sense of time. It could be, a, you know, a thousand years into the future. It can be a thousand years in the past. It can be anything that you kind of move around in a liberated way. And I think in a sense, for me, that is always that reconnection with childhood, that re-return to that place, um, which seems to be a kind of like a, a theme to all the images that I make. That on one hand, there's the kind of the, 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 the contained, ordered structure with this sense of liberated energy so you and said the, all your work you said that mm, all your work is a quest for love yeah yeah i think it's a quest um love joy peace yeah so yeah. In this kind of image I, I just find this such a fascinating again like almost like a point of tension for me is that we have an mm. artist whose quest is for love and and what that umbrella term means but we also have someone who's creating split, a split somehow in themselves over and over in order to yes. find something that is whole. Yeah, I would say that there's an element of that. I would say that there's an element of, um, uh, I think there's an element of return, a need to that, that constant element of return is a, is a, is a massive theme. And it's a return to what you could describe for me, a freedom. I find I, I found that as I became an adult, that liberation became less and less possible. I felt less liberated. And I think that the, the, the sort of the, the feeling for me was that was that loss of liberation. And, I, and, and I, I think there's a constant need to return to that liberation because for me, there is a feeling of love within that liberation. There's a sense of a peace within that. Um, I've, I've found adult life difficult. Yeah, I would say that that's, that's me. I think I found adult life difficult as an exile. <laughs> These are really big words though, and they're totally loaded mm. as we know. So when we use word like exile, mm. I would assume that it means that you feel like you can't return. I can't return to childhood in the sense that biologically I'm now 58. So but there is that kind of sense. Nonetheless, mm. and you did acknowledge this earlier, that you have yeah. the presence of the child within you at all times. Yes, yeah. And um, which is, which is um, how we describe it, it, it. You could describe it as a blessing and a curse. Yeah, but also <laughs> but, uh, in that, maybe we don't need to look so far for the thing we seek. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, your, your uh, work is, is a, it, it, it's like a, an avalanche of kind of joyous exploration. I dug a bit deeper and I found a root of sadness mm -hmm. or certainly something that was poignant. Yes. And then I saw a great irony because that need to return is something that is simply encapsulated by who you are. Mm. Where you need to return to is always present. And even in images that don't so obviously make a show of it, like this one, mm. we have, again, I, I, you think of it almost like a sliding door mm. of bringing attention is bringing attention to energy that is you mm. and that you are the sum total of the things you look for yeah good point you know 
Yeah. I mean, you have a, a, a keen eye, something that sees color, yes, um, although not necessarily color that just anybody might see in the same scene or the same place. Mm. But there is a lot of work, uh, certainly in the books, that are, is, is no color, it's just pen work. And we have a, an abundance of texture. There's always so much happening in these images. And yet, by the time I got to this, I felt very peaceful again. Mm. I don't know if you've ever seen Richard Linklater's uh, Waking Life. No. Um, I would recommend that for you to watch as an animation. It's a, it's a feature length movie. It's presented kind of like a documentary going around different characters who have at the time in the late 90s a pioneering animation technique where um, paint and pen were applied frame by frame to get a kind of again this word oscillation there's a constant movement and agitation in all the people in film speaking about various topics and mm. um, uh, that in itself makes me wonder your work strikes me as being very much of human presence though not of humans Mm. So I can see that there are characters, but even when we go right back to the very beginning, the human form is kind of caricatured and not as evident as other forms that nonetheless are still about human human experience. Yeah, yeah, interesting observation. Well, again, I wonder for you thinking about what what it is to be an artist. What does it mean to be an artist, Steve? Um, it it for me it's liberation. A, a liber yeah, a sense of feeling liberated, a sense of or having the possibility of searching for liberation. That's, a, that's what I find. And I, and I find that there's energy that I have a need to pass on. That's how I feel that there's a kind of a, a, a so if, if, I, if I took the perspective of saying, right, I don't produce anything, mm. then what I would do is it would probably be converted into movement, physical movement. Mm. So if I stopped tomorrow creating or generating marks and images, that would be movement. <laughs> why do I do that? Why do I look, why, you know, what is it for me looking at, you know, that was a particular paddle boarding day. I went off, I paddle board around Christchurch Harbour. I pulled the paddle board up and sat down by the side and again, space. Now this could be again, a, a rugby thing. You know, I, I, I was, a, the skill that I had as a rugby player was I was very, very good at finding spaces very quickly. So I have an ability to be able to find space, proportionate space, exploit it and score tries. That was basically what rugby is about, isn't it? It's finding space and finding it accurately, using it properly and then crossing a line. That's what I could do. I could do it quite quickly. And I find that the drawing enables me to kind of look and if there's, there's, a, sen there's a sense of... Um, mastery i suppose the capacity to be able to look at things and to put them in their places so there's a sense of control and a sense of ordering and a sense of um puzzle making finding space hmm. in spots that others would not see is this true of all aspects of your life yeah space is a big one and, mm. and is that about actually finding a kind of psychological niche where you feel comfortable? Yes, I think that's an interesting, and that's a really, really interesting way of, yes, I would say that it is about finding a space psychologically. So a physical space that becomes a psychological space. So, I mean, the work like this, to me, I mean, it would be lazy of me just to say, well, this is abstract, therefore it's about psychological space. Mm. But in context of all the other work I've seen of yours, I would say that this is actually very much about the psychology of Steve Pell. Mm. 
um, more overtly than we could say that all painting or all artwork is just a psychological recording of mm -hmm. the individual who makes it. Things that I would take from this as a, as a viewer who's been privileged enough to read your words, to see your images, is that there's a constant tension between these states of inner mm. and outer, of past and present. I wonder what you feel about the future. The future, um, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, I think that, that what, what excites me about the future is that as I get older, I get closer to being able to spend more time making imagery. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, that a large aspect of my adult life has been taken up by order and structure, <laughs> paying bills, yeah. maintaining houses. But again, is the art making uh, a truthful response to to love? Yeah, I would say it is. Or yeah, is it a reactive state to being held in thrall by normal adult life, so to speak, where we do have to have a job that pays a mortgage? Or I mean, we don't, but we choose it. We choose it. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. choose it. I think that there's, I think that, I think the first part that you're talking about is true. I think there is that kind of, the sense of, the sense of returning to that feeling of love, joy, that sense of a kind of, uh, na naive is the wrong word, it's not naive because it's present now. Mm -hmm. I find that I find med I find the med I, so I meditate daily and one of the processes of that for me is just very very simply it, I don't want it to be sound high fluting because it's not it's just a case of just sitting still and then just listening to my breathing that's what I do and I and I've done that for many many years and that kind of there's a sense of communion in that a sense of a sense of wholeness a sense of being in a space that is um, safe, loving, warm, held. And I find I can return to that space in that daily kind of process. Out of that comes my image making. I find that without, no. sorry, Sam, yeah, go on. The word that you use now frequently and it's written all over the place is return. Mm. Yeah. Return. Uh, and I, I say this to you because you do use language all the way through your work, mm. written language. Um, the word return, is there an implication that you must return to something to repeat the experience of something you once had because you no longer feel it? I think that there is a sense of return I think no. I think that I, it's, it's it's interesting. I I would say that it's it's something that is definitely present and current, mm -hmm. and certainly something that I'm aware of. So the return aspect to it is a kind of a, a, a daily kind of um, state of presence. I think I think the return is the is the leaving of the speed of daily life. I think that the, the I find that that life. For all of us, internet, the speed of our decision making in relation to the world in which we live, the internet, the, the way that technology suggests and, and uh, motivates us, if you like, to search and to associate and to find and to press another button and to keep pressing buttons on our phones and our uh, various places. So it, it, it's, it's, a it's a return or a, a, an attempt to leave that world of, of, of constancy so that I can kind of go, ah, peace. And in that space, that's where I find that feeling. Uh, 
I'm of course not going to disagree with you. But mm. I still, I think, I think I actually, uh, I find it, I find the word return problematic because mm. it suggests something to me, and this is as much about my codifications of language as anything else. When I hear the word return, it strikes me that that that's quite difficult for somebody who is so present <laughs> mm. that, that that's conflict and that actually mm. it's an incredible violence to oneself to need to to go back mm. and there, there's a, you know everything marvelous about reflecting on childhood for example mm. but the need to return it to find something that is actually available to you now is such a curious thing and it has a high yield for you because you make so much work out of it yes yeah absolutely there is yes it's sandy it, it, it there's an interesting aspect because again the other aspect which is an important one to this going back to that very very first image that you showed of the house and the so right at the very very beginning this this yellow coated this character here is an interesting one because there, I think the sadness, the tension is, is it could well be out of, um, you know, at the age of 14, my dad died. So there was a, a, a very, very important point in my life developmentally, uh, my, my dad died. And I think that that isn't, is certainly um, an, a need to return an unresolved aspect to me as a human being. I think that when I look at this image here, this, this picture of yellow on the house are choices that he as an individual made. So the house was yellow. In reality, it was that color. Um, the reality was that my dad took that color. Um, the, the shape of the windows of front are important because Another choice that he made on that house is that to take out that little kind of window that would normally have been there, which then became a, a 1970s kind of replacement. So that went in. The other aspect of it is the picture doesn't quite show it, but the, the, the dry stone or the, not the dry stone, but the, the low wall along each house in the street. The, and this remains to this day, actually, in this street. Um, the wall is removed. There isn't a wall there. So in the 14 houses down this street, you would look down there and the house hasn't got a wall on it. Again, a choice that my dad made. So there's there's a kind of um, a, a connectedness that was broken at that age. Mm. Um, and from the age of 14, there was a sense of having to make it up as I go along um, as, as in all sorts of aspects of my life. Um, the, the sport aspect was, of course, was cultural from a rugby point of view because of Wales being Wales, but it was also something that my dad did. It was something that was his, something that maybe been a connection that I want, didn't want to let go of. Um, so I think that that tension, that sad... Do go on, Sam. Do you ever make work about your dad more specifically and less obliquely? Never have, no. So that that is something that is I would there, there's some there, there's some kind of theme around that that incredible sadness an incredible sense of um, loss and um, a, a, an incredible sense I suppose of aloneness there's a loneliness in that I think that I lost. equally and, and I hope I don't speak out of turn but I would no, 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 also all. suggest that there's an incredible sense of love in that Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And so it strikes me that much as I understand it would be hugely challenging to do mm. it, that I do wonder what that work would look like. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. And I think it's totally relevant. I think you're right. The, 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 the aspect of love for my dad, the loss of that, has certainly informed everything from that age onwards in terms of what I've done, the choices I've made, how I've operated in life. 
mm. have probably been informed by that kind of sense of um isolation there's certainly an isolation in the work for me um or so not necessarily in the work but certainly an isolation as a as a human being mm. as a as a person work, walking on this world a keen sense of um aloneness aloneness and isolation um and i think that the coming to terms with that and the, the sense of trying to make sense of what that is means that i return yeah. i keep returning to try and make sense of, of what that is you know i hope it was okay to keep pressing you until you oh great no really good really good and really positive because i think that that's how things move forward um that, that kind of sense of well, actually, I'm not going to let this go. I'm going to keep working up because what that has done is it's kind of pinpointed a particular point, a, a, a catastrophic, traumatic point in my life where things change forevermore as me as a, as a person, as a boy growing up. So how does that boy in that image become a man? That was the question in a sense, you know. And I think a lot of the work that I've created, these, these images of, of boyhood, and the sense of being in that past and the reason why they characterize is that that need to be and to return to that kind of little boy if that makes sense batman boy yeah invincible unbreakable yeah yeah can fly steve thank you so much for being so open with me mm and also sharing your beautiful your beautiful work with me i, I think thank you really myself for myself very stimulating work um, i mean there are lots of things i could have said that i haven't said i'll just give a quick overview of the things i maybe expected to say that haven't come up mm -hmm. i did mention something like richard link later for you to look at things like this waking life um but also for me looking at work and inevitably um, as an art teacher, picking out likenesses between what you do and what other people have done. So, you know, for me, yes, Batman's cape, but also a sense of um, like a, a, a lucidity in fantasy uh, that's reminiscent of someone like Chagall, especially in this work where he and his wife float above the world, unfettered by worry which in itself, of course, becomes even more poignant because of her untimely death and his subsequent sense of incredible loss. Um, I know that you, or I think I know, that you really admire um, the work of Jonas Wood mm. and that you've written, actually, that you wish you could spend some time with him. And of course, yes. you look at work like this and this mm. and even this up to a point Mm. colorless yes but not in any way diminished by lacking color as a sense of crossover between you and someone that you admire mm. you know maybe Jonas would ought to be thinking I wish I could speak, speak to Steve Hill <laughs> mm. there's so much in it and I, I've seldom encountered somebody who as an adult still maintains this breadth of style Mm. Now, it isn't just constantly working in the same way all the time. You are working in the same way. The underpinning sense of it is through this, through this uh, specifically Steve sensibility of return. Mm. And I'm very grateful that you've shared with me, with us, about what that return is. Thank you, Sandy. It has been it has been a pleasure and, and and a journey, and it's been something that is certainly I, what I take away from it is uh, that that sense of um, continuing what I do, um, and I would much I would really value the continued kind of dialogue that we're having around where it goes next and what happens for it, you know, um, because I think what it provides for me is that kind of sense of insight and, and looking at, you know, I look at it all the time. I feel the thing, I draw it, I, I make it, but to have an externalized perspective of it outside looking in really helps me to kind of, to look at things in ways that I hadn't really considered. And I found that that is exactly what I was hoping that the, the, the kind of conversations that we could have would do that. 
Mm-hmm. And I and I what I really, really value is the, the the being pushed on things and being challenged. I think that is that is so 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 helpful. So thank you. It's been it's been an absolute pre- a pleasure. Well, it seems really strange now to say I'll see you at school in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but if you haven't already and, and people watching if you don't already subscribe or if you don't uh, indeed follow Steve on Instagram he's got the most extraordinary wealth of work on Instagram please follow him tell us the tell us the the name it's uh Steve Pill Paintings Steve Pill Paintings on Instagram follow him now go and see what else he's been doing and remains for me to say thank you very much for giving me your time, lending me your sketchbooks and, and sharing a, a very uh, real sense of why you make what you do. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy.